we live, right? We live in a world that we're just always in a hurry. We're always going somewhere. We want to get there. And, and we're right now in the middle of this series, at, really at the beginning of it, that we've entitled Unhurry, Unhurry. And it's really learning to walk with God in an unhurried world. Last week we began uh, this message, this series, and, and we said this. We said that hurry is a form of violence to the soul. Hurry is a form of violence to the soul. Now, interestingly enough, and some of you after, after Sunday's message, you, you came to me and you said, if my spouse unhurries any more than they are already unhurried, they're going to be dead. Now, and I don't know if that means they're going to help them get dead or not, but violence to the soul. But, but when you stop and really think about it, hurry is typically a sign that, that something's wrong, right? Because hurry is not about a disordered schedule. It's about a disordered heart. It's about a heart that can't just sit and be in a place for that moment and that time and, and to focus and to hear. And to just be. I mean, it's hard, isn't it? Because some of you, you've got stuff you've got to do after this. My wife and I, had a, after, after the second service, we're taking a little trip. We're going to Chattanooga because it's a little Christmas gift we gave each other. We're going to spend a couple of days up there in the snow, right? And it's really hard for me not to be there, not to be in the car, not to be going, okay, I hope the preacher doesn't go too long because we want to get out of here in time. And it's like, wait a minute, somebody's got control over that, right? I mean... Because it's hard just to be here. It's hard to be present. And yet, and yet, this is the only place we can do life. We can only do life in the presence. And this is where God meets us. God meets us in the presence. And, and when we are in such a hurry, we just, we just blow by the present. And we miss God. There's an old Finnish proverb that says this. God did not create hurry. God did not create hurry. In fact, in fact, I think I can prove that hurry is one of the most unchristian things you and I can do. I, I really think I can prove that. So, so uh, just think with me for a minute. Um, what is the most important thing, most important value, if you will, in a Christian's life, in a follower of Jesus' life? Or, to put it in other words, if, if your kids were part of Kids Club, this past Wednesday, we, we taught the lesson, and the lesson was, what are Jesus's, what were Jesus's two rules that we all follow? Two rules. Jesus only had two rules, right? Let's see how good you are. What are the two rules of Jesus? You ready? Rule number one is what? Love, love God. Right. Love God. And rule number two is? Love others. Yeah, it's just, just that simple. In the kingdom of God, here's the highest value is, is that of love, loving God and, and loving others. The problem is, love is painfully slow, isn't it? Love is slow. And I know we don't like to hear that because we like watching the movies and we like the shows where, where boy meets girl and there's an explosion and there's an instant romance and it's just, it's just beautiful and wonderful and it just takes off and it's just climatic and it's just, it's just meant to be and it's just perfect and it's just not real, right? True love grows over time. True love grows as you really get to know each other. Love is painfully slow as you go through the ups and downs of life. That's where love is born. That's where love is bred. That's where love, where love grows. You see, and love is painfully, painfully slow. It just is. And in fact, in fact, I would say that for all of us, if we are followers of Christ, if we're followers of God, you know, one of the things we never talk about is, is the idea that when, when we uh, are with God, you never, you never run with God, do you? Unless you're crazy long-distance runners, and sometimes we run with God. But what do you say? You always walk with God. Because love is what? It is, it is slow. Love takes, love takes time. And in fact, in fact, when you think about it, hurry, the opposite of slow, right? The opposite of love. Hurry kills, doesn't it? I mean, just, just think about it. Think, think, about, think about your relationships, right? 
all your relationships. I don't know about you, but I can tell you about me. I can tell you that, that in, in all my relationships, as a, as a husband, as a father, as a, as a grandfather, as a friend, as a pastor, all the mistakes I've made in my life, all the big blow-ups that have happened have all come when I'm in a hurry. When I got to get somewhere and I don't have time to talk to you, when I need to be there, when I need you to understand what I'm saying before I even say it, just so we can get going and get moving because I've got something to do, I've got a place to be, I've got something on a screen that I need to watch. Right? And what happens? It just kills our relationships. Hurry kills relationships. Not only that, hurry kills joy. Because joy is what? Joy is deep. It is satisfying. It is long-lasting. It is, it is something that, that you, you sit in and you soak in. It's not just a happy joke. It's not just a laugh for a moment. Those are fine. Joy is so much deeper, so much sweeter, and it takes what? Time. Hurry kills wisdom. Because wisdom is learned over time, and it's, wisdom comes from thought and from, from perspective and from contemplation. And we get in a hurry, we just what? We just blow right past it, and we miss the lesson in the moment. We, wish, we miss what's going on in the moment because we are in such a, such a hurry. Hurry kills creativity, doesn't it? Because creativity happens when you consider the blank canvas before you. You consider the open space that is there, and you, you think about it. You, you wonder what could be. How, how can I make this come together? Sometimes in our life, we're hit with hard things and empty spaces, empty thoughts, empty relationships, and we just want to get out of it. We just want something to fix it. We just don't want to stay there. And the problem is, we miss the opportunity for God to do something creative and beautiful in that moment because we want to get out of that moment so fast. Hurry kills creativity. Hurry kills generosity. It just does. I mean, you can, you can stroke a check in just a few seconds, right? That's easy. That's not generosity. Generosity comes when I do more than just give financially. Generosity comes when I give part of myself to someone else or to some cause. And it's, it's, it takes time to do that. It takes time to, to think about that cause, to think about that person, to think about what this gift might be able to do, what it might be able to engender, what it might be able to grow within them. See, hurry. Hurry just kills. Kills relationships, joy, wisdom, creativity, and, and generosity. And see, the Apostle Paul tells us, he tells us this in 1 Corinthians, writing to the church at Corinth, when he begins to describe what love is. Some of you are familiar with this verse, with this chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where he begins to describe love. Verse 4, he begins to define it. And he says, love is, and what's the word? You probably know the word. Love is what? Patient. Love is is patient. Love takes, love takes time. But it's so hard for us, it is so hard for us to slow down. And in fact, in our world, in our world, slow, slow is negative, isn't it? Nobody, nobody wants to be called slow. Hey, you're awful slow, right? Right? I mean, just look it up in the dictionary. The dictionary, some of the definitions of slow is obviously not quick, but there's others, right? Slow means mentally dull. Slow means sluggish. Slow means lacking in readiness and willpower. See, that's, that's our culture, and our culture is anti-slow. It is on go. And yet, if we're going to find the life that Christ has for us, we've got to learn to slow down, to unhurry, and to be with God and with others. You see, friends, there are gifts that God wants to bring us, but these gifts never come in a hurry. They are the slow gifts of God. And the first one, we've already talked about that, is love, because love takes time. Yes, for God so loved the world. God has shown his love for us, has demonstrated his love for us. But if we want to live in that love, we've got to take time and walk with God and know God and, and be with God, you see. It just takes time. If we want to receive the gift of joy from God, it takes, it takes time. Because joy 
comes through difficult circumstances and knowing that God is with us and that he is leading us and guiding us and he has never let go of us. And in that, we find this peace that passes understanding and this sense of God is with me. God, I matter to God and I'm going to be okay. And there's a sense of joy with that. But it takes time. Gift of peace, right? Love, joy, and peace. Peace that, that passes understanding. Peace that is, that is greater than the absence of conflict. Peace that comes in the midst of conflict. But that kind of peace doesn't come instantly. It comes over time. And you see, we're an instant world. We have left our crock pots behind and have bought Instapots, right? Because we want it now, right? But that's not the way life works. That's not the way God works. You see, our world is upside down from what God's world is. And for us, you see, we really believe that that life with Jesus is best. And, and, And if we believe that, what that means is that that life is filled with love, joy, and peace that God gives us. And and that's the best life that Jesus wants to give us and wants us to live in that. And he wants to cultivate these things in our life. But see, it's that word cultivation that we don't like. We want God to just give us these things, but that's not the way God works. God cultivates them in our life. And cultivation is is what? It's preparing the ground for growth, preparing the soil of your life so that these seeds of love, joy, and peace can grow in our lives. But friends, it just takes time. And we've got to be willing to unhurry to get there. I mean, think about this this metaphor, this story that Jesus tells, this parable, if you will. Um, It's really not a parable. It's it's Jesus speaking to his disciples and And he's looking at all the people around them that are just running around crazy, trying to accomplish life, trying to survive, trying to get ahead. And here's what Jesus says to them. He's he's using this cultivation, this this agriculture metaphor. Here's what he says, Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. We'll talk about what a yoke is. And let let me teach you. Notice that word teach. We'll come back to that. Let me teach you. Jesus goes on. Because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest. That word rest. That word shalom. It means love, joy, peace. You will find these incredible gifts for your soul. For my yoke is easy to bear. And the burden I give you is light. Now most of you in this room probably know what a yoke is. That's that's a yoke, right? And what do they use it for? It's used to take two animals, typically two oxen, and put them together, and they pull a cart or they pull a plow, they get some work done. And typically what a farmer would do was he would take an experienced, stronger animal and put that with a weaker, younger, inexperienced animal so that the stronger animal could lead the way and could teach the younger animal how to pull correctly, how to follow the commands of the driver, how to, how to do the task that is before them. That's that's why you yoked two animals together. Jesus is saying, come and walk with me. Come and be yoked to me. Come and be tied to me. Let me teach you how to walk. Maybe in today's metaphor, Jesus would say, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's do a three-legged race together, and I will show you how to walk, right? Because that's what we think about. You ever do a three-legged race? You tie your legs together and you have to walk together. You have to work together. You have to stride together. It's no fair to do it with a child and just pick up a kid and run. That it works, but it's not fair, right? I mean, it's not that I would know, but anyway, right? Slow down, Jim, slow down. Jesus said, if you want to experience life, the rest that I have to give you, life with Jesus is best, He said, be yoked to me. Come and walk with me. And let me do what? Let me teach you these things. Now, it's interesting. When Jesus says, let me teach you, you see, we don't want Jesus to teach us. We want Jesus to give us, right? Just give us these things, Lord. Just give us these things. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, let me teach you these things, which means what? Which means it's got to take time because we're all slow learners. 
And Jesus said, let me teach you these things. I want you to discover these gifts that I want to give you. And what is it that Jesus teaches us? Well, think about this. What does Jesus teach us? If we're a disciple of Jesus, what does he teach us? Well, what did Jesus come to teach us? Well, Jesus came to teach us about God, right? About who God is and who he is, how he is the son of God, and how he came to earth to die for our sins and and that he would resurrect from the grave and that that he would be the savior of the world, the Messiah. He would be be God. And and he came to teach us that and how to relate to God and, and all about grace. I mean, that's what Jesus came to teach us. And and we call, that, we call that theology. That's what Jesus came to teach, was theology to us. Who God is, what God is all about. Not only that, but Jesus also came to teach us morals. Teach us, here's how to live life. He goes, I've created this thing. I know how it's supposed to work together. Here's the way I created the world to work together. Here's the way to follow me. This is how we should live together. And, and, and he taught us these things. And he taught us it wasn't just about our actions. It's also about our thoughts, right? Sermon on the Mount. You may say you, you, it's wrong to commit murder. But Jesus says if you hate your brother in your heart, it's kind of the same deal, right? It's wrong to, to commit adultery. But if you look after another person and lust after them, you've created adultery in your heart. Because it's kind of the same deal. So when we talk about morals, we're talking about not just what we do, but what our heart calls us to do. We call these things what? Ethics. And we think this is what Jesus came to teach us. He came to teach us who God is, theology, and how we are supposed to live on this life with each other. That's called ethics. And most followers of Jesus agree on about 95.3% of these things. I mean, you get a little bit of variation in theology, just a little bit about, well, who God is and how it all works together and how it all ties together. But for the most part, we got the big stuff together. And morals, well, for the most part, followers of Jesus have that together. Maybe we're down to 87.4. We disagree on some things, but but we agree on the big ones. Love God, love your neighbor, figure out what Jesus is trying to tell you to do through his word, and and let's, let's move on here. But you know what I've found is that most followers of Jesus, this is where our discussion is. Who is God, and how are we to live that out? And many followers of Jesus are stuck right there. And then when you say, hey, Jesus wants to have you live your best life. Life is best with Jesus. And if we're honest, and we said we're going to try to be honest, we may not be living that best life. In fact, we look around and there are people that aren't followers of Jesus and their life seems a whole lot better than ours. I know that's not a word. I just made that up, right? Um, I would say, well, what's going on? Why, why am I not living my best life with Jesus? And we, we just dig in deeper and we go, all right, I got to get more, more right theology. Okay. I got to get more right morality, more right ethics. And maybe if you're not doing what God wants you to do, that is going to hinder your walk, and it is going to, especially if you're doing it habitually and, and, and callously. But for the most part, I think that most followers of Jesus are at least attempting to live as Jesus called us to live. And we all fail from time to time. So, so why aren't we living our best life yet? I think there's a third thing that Jesus is trying to teach us that we miss. And I think this is why many people, many followers of Christ are not experiencing their best life with Jesus. And I also think this is why people who aren't followers of Christ look at Christians and they say, why do I want what you got? Because it doesn't seem to be making a difference in you with <laughs> your love, joy, and peace. In fact, you seem to be angry, bitter, and confused. The third thing I think Jesus came to teach us, he said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Again, if we're yoked to Jesus, what we're going to learn is how to walk with Jesus. And what do I mean by that? I think Jesus came to teach us a rule of life. You say, well, what's... What's a rule of life? Well, a rule of life is simply how you live your daily life. And and the best way I can explain it is is with this. Just just take a look at the screen. Stacy, can we start that again with some volume, please? Sometimes.
sometimes I dream that he is me. Got to see that's how I dream to be. Sing it. Like Mike, like, 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 like Mike, like Mike, like Mike, like Mike. Right? Remember that? How many of you were around in the 90s when that was real, right? Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player ever, period. You heard it here. God said it. That did it. It's over, right? MJ, why do you think I shaved my head? Well, God has got a part of that. I mean, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Anyway. You remember back in the 90s, right? Michael Jordan was it. And every basketball player, every person wanted to be like Mike. Now, what did they want to know? They wanted to know, how does Michael Jordan hit a jump shot? What is his form? What is his pure form? How is it, how is it like perfect? I mean, they wanted to know how he did what he did. But, but, it was, but it was more than that, wasn't it? They wanted to be like Mike. So what did that mean? That meant that they wanted to know, what did Mike eat for breakfast? What did Mike drink, right? Gatorade. What did Mike wear? What time did Mike get up in the morning? How did he work out? What time did he go to bed? How did he walk? How did he hang his tongue out when he shot the shot, right? Because I'm going to, how many kids worked on hanging their tongue out to shoot the shot. Now, now your era might not have been the Michael Jordan era, but your era had somebody where you tried to be like that person, and you bought the clothing, and you, you tried to talk like them, you tried to walk like them, you tried to be like them. And what you wanted to know was their rule of life. What time did you get up in the morning? What do you do next? Which shoe did you put on first? And some of you, some of you do this. Some of you uh, have gotten into coaching programs and, and those type of things. And you, you want them to tell you, what is it exactly I need to do to be successful? Right before I go in for the big sales pitch, don't just tell me, don't just tell me these leadership principles, but tell me exactly what you do. Like, what time do you get up in the morning? And what do you do from, for the first 30 minutes? And after that, what do you do after that? And then after that, what do you do after that? If, you, if, you're, into, if you're into fitness or if you're into any kind of sport activity, you find somebody that you want to emulate and it's more than just emulating their form. You want to emulate their life. You want to know their rule of life. What do you do from moment to moment, day to day? In Jesus' day, in Jesus' day, the rabbis, if you were a young Hebrew person, you wanted to follow a rabbi. And what did that mean? Well, that meant you wanted to learn from that rabbi. You wanted to understand the Torah, the Scripture, the Old Testament, as that rabbi understood that Torah and the Old Testament. You wanted to live with the same kind of ethics that that rabbi lived with. But it was more than that. You wanted to become like that rabbi. So what did you do? You literally went where they went. You literally ate what they ate. You literally said what they said. The saying was that students would eat the dust of their rabbi because they were following so closely to him, trying to be what? Trying to be exactly like him. So what are we trying to say? Jesus said, let me teach you these things. Let me teach you about God. Let me teach you about morality, about ethics. But also, let me teach you how to live this life. Let me teach you a new rule of life. A way to live, a way to walk. Think about this. A disciple, we call ourselves, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a disciple of Jesus. A disciple is one who lives their life according to a disciplined, what? Plan. This is how you live. This is what you do. This is what happens next. Jesus is calling us to be yoked to him, to learn how to do what? To learn what he taught? Yes. To learn how he lived? Absolutely. But also to learn his rule of life. I think that's what Paul is referring to in the book of Philippians. In the book of Philippians, it's kind of a crazy verse. Paul writing to them, he says this. He says to these new Christians in Philippi, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who wills in you to work, will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, what, what in the world does Paul mean when he says... Work out your own salvation. Is Paul talking about theology? Absolutely not. 
Paul's not saying, hey, look, if you don't like who God says he is, who Jesus says he is, just kind of figure out something better than that. I mean, you, you're, you're intelligent, but figure it out, right? Paul's not saying that. Paul's not saying, hey, you don't like what Jesus said you about loving your neighbors and, and following his commands. He said, well, you know, hey, just skip it. Figure out which ones you like best and just hang on to them and kind of just ignore the rest. It's okay. You just, you know, Paul's not saying that. It's ludicrous. What is Paul saying? He's saying, okay, you Philippians, you who live in a Gentile city, who did not grow up Jewish as Jesus did, learn to work out this rule of life that Jesus is trying to teach us and learn how to live it out in your local context. Again, not live out the theology, not learn to live out your theology in your local context. No, theology is truth. It's truth about God. Not live out morality in your local context. No, what God said is, is the right way to live is the right way to live has always been the right way to live. But he's saying in the context of where you live, try to figure out what does it mean to follow and to live and to be a disciple of Jesus. What was Jesus' rule of life? Now, how does this work? Let me, let me just give you an example of this. So, so Jesus, Jesus never told his disciples to go get up early in the morning and go pray. Re- read the Gospels. He, he never said that, did he? Never did. Never did. Never did. But what did he do? He got up every morning, early in the morning, and went out and prayed. So... Do you think Peter, James, Mary, John, Bartholomew, especially after Jesus was resurrected and gone, do you think that that as they grew in their walk with Christ that that they got up early in the morning and went out to pray? You bet they did. Why? Because Jesus commanded it? Nope, he didn't. But because Jesus demonstrated it. You see, that was Jesus' rule of life. His rule was every morning I'm going to get up and I'm going to spend quiet time with my heavenly Father. Now, if you don't do that, are you going to hell? No, no, no. Your salvation is not based upon your rule of life. Your salvation is based upon who God is and what God has said and what Jesus has done. That's what your salvation is based upon. But if you want to experience the best life that Jesus has for you, will that impact your best life with Jesus? You bet it will. And that's why so many followers of Jesus aren't experiencing the best life with Christ because we're allowing our culture to determine our rule of life. What does culture tell me? Get up and go. You got to hit it. You got to run. You ain't got time to stop. You ain't got time to think. Just go, go, go. Get to the next object. Get to the next place. Just go be there because the more you do, more is better. And just go, 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 right? That's, that's, what, that's what our world teaches us. And Jesus came and he said, I'm living according to a whole different rule of life. My rule of life is slow. You see? And so, as we begin to live this out and to live in this, we got to think about, what does this mean? How are we to live our life in Christ, in this upside-down world? How do we find out this rule of life that Jesus has for us? Well, it begins when we begin to read the Gospels of Jesus just a little bit differently. Now, what is the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're the four, if you will, biographies of Jesus. They're the books that tell us about Jesus. Now, and we read them so differently than we read any other biography. Again, we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those biographies about Jesus, looking for two things, theology and ethics. And that's not wrong. It's not wrong. What I want to challenge you with this week is to look for a third thing. And that's Jesus' rule of life. What did Jesus do? What happened when Jesus got up in the morning? What happened when Jesus was interrupted by people? What happened when Jesus was upset? What was Jesus' go-to? What was his rule of life? You see, we, we don't do that with anybody else. We don't do that with any other biographies. Any other biographies we read, we're trying to figure out how does this person do their daily life. 
And so our challenge is, if we're really going to get serious about unhurrying and get serious about living this best life with Jesus, it's to try to begin to figure out this Jesus rule of life. How did Jesus manage his days? What were they like for him? Now, here's the hard part. Here's the hard part. And here's why Paul wrote that to the Philippians, in my opinion. Because Jesus never had an iPhone. Right? Jesus never listened to a podcast while on a treadmill. He just didn't. Jesus was never a parent, much less a single parent of four kids under the age of nine, Sean. Um, so, so what am I saying? So we have to understand, here was Jesus' rule of life in first century Palestine, Israel. What can we learn from that? And then the question is, how do we apply that to our lives today? How do we take Jesus' rule of life, not change the rules, not change what Jesus was doing, not change his, his rule of life, but, but how do we apply that today in our world where Jesus never traveled more than probably 50 to 75 miles away from his hometown in one direction? Never did. You and I will travel 50 miles probably today if you do any kind of traveling around at all, right? So we have to learn Jesus' rule of life and then say, okay, how do we live in that today? And that's our challenge. And so as we go forward these next four weeks, what we're going to be talking about, what our teaching team is going to be talking about, are these very issues, Jesus' rule of life, things that Jesus did consistently and asking ourselves the question, how do we then begin to apply those to our life? How do we begin to live in that rule of life so that we can what? We can begin to experience truly life with Jesus' best because that's what he wants us to have. So our challenge for this week is simple. It's to put on a different pair of lenses and read one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. By the way, Mark's the shortest, just FYI. I know you, and you know me, right? Um, we're always in a hurry, right? So anyway, so, um, but, but what I want you to read it is to read it and ask the question, how did Jesus order his daily life? What did Jesus do on a daily basis? What was Jesus' rule of life? And then begin to think, how can I apply those rules to my life? Because here's what we know is true. Because God tells us it's true. Life with Jesus is best. And he wants us to live it and to experience it. It comes when we know who God is. And what Jesus has done for us. It comes as we walk as Jesus told us to walk. And as we live as Jesus told us to live. As far as ethics and morality. But that third element. That rule of life. When we begin to get that one down. I truly believe we'll begin to experience. Life with Jesus. Is best. But here's a hint. It means we're all going to have to. Unhurry. Let's pray together. Father God, for this, uh, your word, we give you thanks. And the reality of it, God, that you want us to experience life to the fullest. You told us that, that abundant life. And God, as we endeavor to follow you and to experience that, and not only have it for ourselves, but then to share it with others, I pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom this week as we read your word to open our eyes to to the truths in your scripture, not just the truths about who you are, God, which are beautiful and wonderful. Not just the truths about how we need to order our lives in in terms of our morality and ethics, but God, we need that from you. But, But Lord, this week, open our eyes to see this rule of life, how you are calling us to literally order our days. And what is it, God, that you are calling us to as we seek to unhurry and to just be with you? We pray this in Christ's name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to take a seat again. Um, So, last week, we ended the service with a challenge. Um, The challenge was for us to be aware of our hurriedness in our life and to learn to be still. How did y'all do? 
Yeah, about the, <laughs> about the same as me. Um, I think being aware is the first step. You know, even if we're not successful and being still knowing that maybe I need to be, that's a good place to start. Um, so this past, uh, this uh, yesterday, I went to my, uh, my, my niece's birthday party. She turned one. And uh, it was, you know, it was fun and everything. And it came time for the gift opening. And so we brought all the gifts to her. And you know what happened next. You know, she got the first gift, threw it all Got all the wrapping paper out of the way. She looked at it, and then what happened next? Pushed it to the side. Grabbed the next gift. Unwrapped it like a hot mess. Looked at it, and then what she do? Pushed it to the side and went for the next one. This happened over and over again. This doesn't stop the older you get. It just it tends to happen. Um, and as Jim was talking about this, these gifts that God has ready and made and ready to give us, these gifts of love, joy and peace he gives us these gifts because he wants us to have that best life and i wonder how many times we're like thank you god you know thank you god we unwrap it and we just shove it to the side and we don't take time to really enjoy it and so this this week i'm I'm follow up what jim was saying our challenge this week is we're going to pick one of those gospels right and as we read it we're going to take our time with this gift. We're going to open each page like we're unwrapping a present and say, God, what do you have for me? My fear is this, is that as a culture, as a people of God, we have settled for a good life when he has prepared the best life for us. And so as you read it, just unwrap that present and say, God, thank you for this gift. And learn to be still, learn to be not in a hurry. And just be with your Heavenly Father this week. Y'all receive that? Amen. All right, well, let's stand and let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time in your presence and with your people. God, I pray that you would help us to be aware of our hurried life, learn to be still and to slow down, and enjoy the gifts that you're giving us every single day. God, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done. In your son's name I pray, amen. Go in peace. Have a good day. The verdict was guilty.